Thank you, Shane, for leading us and the worship team as well. And thank you, Shane, as well, for kind of priming the pump there for, for me here this morning. We have sung these words that are so familiar to us. Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. And, you know, that's why we are here, certainly, and that is to worship and adore Christ the Lord. Again, not the newborn King anymore, but the ascended and risen King. And not the babe in a manger anymore, but the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God to whom belongs honor and glory forever and ever. Paul writes that to Timothy. And, and how, how glorious it is uh, to come together and to realize again that the Lord Jesus certainly is deserving of our focused attention. And I trust that as we uh, have sung some songs that we're kind of familiar with and we can look at some passages here, that, that we won't let familiarity breed contempt, that we would allow God the Holy Spirit to minister to us uh, through his word. When I pastored Eastridge Baptist Church in Kent, Washington from 1982 to 1989, I remember the first message that I preached, the first Christmas message in 1982 regarding the incarnation. That's what Christmas is about. And I chose to preach out of Philippians chapter 2, what is called the kenosis passage, where Christ emptied himself, it says. That's the word kenoo in the Greek language. And anyway, I, so I preached this message. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. That's the Christmas message. That's, a, that's the incarnation. That's a, that's a great message to preach at Christmas time. But um, I, I know more than got done preaching, and one of the elders came up and and he says, well, that was an interesting Christmas message, and it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> and then I realized, of course, I already kind of knew it, but there are certain passages at Christmas time that we associate hymns and, and talking about the Lord Jesus being born. You know, how can we focus on Christmas without shepherds and wise men? And uh, mistletoe and sleigh bells, you know, you know, those are the things that are added, of course, to all the entrappings of Christmas. But, but Paul tells uh, Timothy to preach the word in season and out of season. And so my passage this morning is a little bit out of season, out of Christmas season. But there's a reason for it, and you'll find out as I keep going here, you know. But we're to study and we're to believe and we're to ponder the incarnation of God the Son all year long, of course. And so we want to look at, at this passage again that we're so familiar with, Luke chapter 2, Luke 2, and I'm going to read starting with verse, verse 4, Luke 2, 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, mark that, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And it came about that while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Such familiar words for us today, such precious words. Pause and pray with me, though. Father, we come before you and we give you praise. Thank you that we can gather in your name, that you are here. Thank you for the incarnation, the birth of your own son who became one of us, lived a perfect life, and died that sacrificial death on our behalf. And we're so grateful that you've given us the, the ministry of, of, uh, of, of proclaiming this message to those around us. And so have your way. Give us ears to hear this morning. Keep us from trafficking through unlived truth this morning as we bow before you one more time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I'm going back in my memory, in my, in my dotage. Do you know what that is? Dotage? <laughs> in my older age, Yeah. But I remember 30 years ago, we just moved here to Bellingham from Kent, and it was Christmas morning, 
at the house that we live, we still live in on Alabama Hill. We got up and we walked outside and, we, and it was a, a, a dusting of snow, two or three inches of snow that morning. And there we had, we'd had some night visitors. And so these high school kids had come and they had secretly, quietly wrote in the snow for us a scripture verse, Luke 2.11, it said. Luke 2.11, just the passage. And of course that passage is, for today... In the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then they had the little fish sign, the ichthus is what it's called, ichthus. And that, that acronym for, the, for ichthus is Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. That's what that means. So anytime you see that, you just think of Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Anyway, our night messengers uh, hadn't given us any advance warning that they were going to come and give us this special scriptural message. But God had been telling his people and had been promoting for uh, years and years, for millennia, the future birth of his Messiah. And you'll notice in your outline there, ancient story, never old. I hope it doesn't get old to us. Ancient story, never old, and I wrote earlier before Jesus was born, those who knew the Old Testament were aware that a Messiah would be born a child, yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring, as Charles Wesley wrote in 17, 1744. And with the New Testament, we understand this precious truth more clearly and completely. Nevertheless, the birth of the Messiah was prophetically anticipated. To the biblically literate mind, it shouldn't have been a complete surprise. And God had addressed this over and over and given it much press, as it were, over the years. And there are over 300 messianic references in the Old Testament and 60 major, 60 major prophecies. And they start in Genesis 3. They start right after Adam and Eve rebelled against God. God said, don't eat from the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, the evil one, tempted, to them, tempted them. Of course, you know the story. And I'm going to look at three passages very briefly uh, of these uh, prophesying the, the, the Messiah's future birth. And, and Genesis chapter 3, you're familiar with it again, verse 14. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Satan, because you have done this, Cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you should go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And then verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. The theologians call this verse the, the proto-evangelium. It's, it's the first reference to the gospel in the Bible. And here this message of hope is found in this curse passage concerning Satan's evil temptation and Adam and Eve's rebellion. And it says in verse 15 again that Satan will bruise Christ's heel. That's what it's referred to. And Christ, of course, would suffer temporarily. Isaiah 53 will say that, that he, is, he is the suffering servant and that he would be bruised, that he would be crushed for our iniquities. But it would be temporary. But then it said as well but Christ will bruise Satan's head. That's a fatal, mortal blow. And by Christ's resurrection from the dead, he, he destroyed the works of the devil, and ultimately he will throw him into the lake of fire, as you know in the book of the Revelation. So that's the first prophecy regarding the Messiah. And then the next one is in Isaiah, another passage again that you know so well, Isaiah chapter 2, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 where it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, referring again to his virgin birth. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And, and the key to this verse, I believe, and the heart of what we call the Christmas story is the name Emmanuel, God with us, and the promise of incarnate deity that God himself would appear as a human infant, God himself in human form. And of course, we tend to focus at Christmas time on the infancy of Christ, but the greater truth is his deity. More astonishing than a baby in a manger is the truth 
that this promised child is the omnipotent creator, the one who rules all that he has created. Such an amazing truth that still should, should stir our hearts even today. And then the third messianic prophecy is the next page, in chapter 9, another very familiar passage again. Chapter 9, verse 6. For a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David over his kingdom. And of course, we know that the rightful heir to David's throne was to be an essential credential of Messiah. One of the many credentials that Jesus Christ fulfilled to a T when he came 2,000 years ago. And that's why Matthew and Luke record Christ's gene genealogy through David. And again, these are very familiar passages that predicted the coming and the birth of the Hebrew Messiah. And uh, we see it come to pass, of course, in the New Testament as we read that, but it, as it was recorded there. So the birth of the Messiah was prophetically anticipated. But secondly, it was personally announced. And it was announced by a most unexpected messenger to a most unlikely audience. Glenn was up here talking about the Gideons, and we know the story of Gideon. You know, what an unlikely audience, what an unlikely person that God would choose and call him a valiant warrior, and because he wasn't certainly at that time. So Luke chapter 2, we're going to go there and kind of settle down there this morning. Luke chapter 2, verse 8, will say, And in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Yeah, this region, of course, is near the town of Bethlehem, and the announcement came in the dark and in the hush of night. Uh, for the shepherds, you know, the, grave, the graveyard shift had, had just begun. It was usually pretty boring. <laughs> Probably yawns had just started here when suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, not out of the blue, but out of the black of night. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, verse 9 again. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. Imagine that. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Yeah, it should be no surprise that the shepherds were frightened by this unexpected visitor out there in the, in the pasture there out in the dark. It says they were sore afraid. I like King James describing. They were frightened with a great fear is what it literally means. Sore afraid. Yeah. And of course, they already knew fear. They were alone in the countryside keeping watch over their flock of sheep and Passover lambs, you see. They were watching Passover lambs. And the predators of the night were out there in the form of robbers and rustlers and uh, rabid animals. Uh, actually, this, where, where this is, by Bethlehem, this is where King David, as a shepherd boy, had, had fought with a bear and a lion, if you know your Old Testament. Remember, he came to take on Goliath, and Saul mocked him, and he said, you little pipsqueak, you know, go back, who are you to come from watching the sheep? You know, and he reminded Saul, that he had fought a bear and a lion right in that area, you see. So, uh, again, have any of you been there to Bethlehem, visited Israel, so on? Anybody here that has have been there? Yeah, I'm sure some of you have. Linda and I were there in March of 2010. And, and of course, being there doesn't make us more spiritual, or talking about it doesn't make us more spiritual, of course. But I just refer to it because it was so surreal to be there, out there at night, to know that that the shepherds were really here, quietness of watching the sheep. You know, they weren't elves from the North Pole. They were, they were really, they were real people. And there, and there they were. And, and they were, the, the angel appeared to these, what I call rural nobodies. Uh, I think Rodney Dangerfield probably was what, would have been one of their friends. You know, he, he got no respect. And they got no respect. In fact, they weren't even allowed to testify in court. No respect at all. Uh, they were lowlifes and, and uh, outcasts, according to the, to the elites. And yet the angel of the Lord himself chose them to announce the birth of the long-predicted Messiah. 
rather than going to Caesar Augustus or Governor Quirinius or the hoity-toity self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. Here we, the, we see the self-proclaimed big shots were ignored. Yay, yay, they, they deserve to be ignored, I believe. And you know, God can do spectacular things in spectacular ways, but he often just chooses to use the ordinary. He chooses to sanctify the mundane, the commonplace. That's why I'm preaching today, quite frankly. That is. That's why you're here today. Yeah, you know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he, and he told them, you know, they were really nothing special. Evidently, some of the folks thought they were pretty special. So he, so he writes to them and he, and he says, for <laughs> it's almost funny, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise, not many, not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. And then he says that no man should boast before God. He says that if we're going to boast, we boast in the Lord, but we have nothing to boast about. We've got some world leaders these days that better sit up and take notice that ultimately no one will boast before God. So God chose to announce the Messiah's birth to lowly shepherds who were watching sheep and lambs. And 30 years later, John the Baptist looked down by the Jordan River and said, and when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not just a lamb, not just any old lamb, but the Lamb of God, the only one who could atone for sin. Jesus was born to die, again, like a Passover lamb. It all fits together here. 1 Corinthians 5 will say that Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And Peter wrote that Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, that he might reconcile us to God. And then he said that it required precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And in the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. How many times? He's referred to in the book of Revelation as a Lamb 27 times. 22 chapters, 27 times. The last book he's referred to as the Lamb. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Only he could do that. It makes sense then why God chose to announce the Messiah's birth to lowly shepherds who were keeping watch over Passover lambs. It makes sense why they feared with a great fear when the angel of the Lord and the glory of the Lord appeared in the dark of night. And it makes sense that God's messenger's first words, the angel's first words were, fear not. What, what a comforting thing to say. What a compassionate thing to say, startling these shepherds and for the angel to say, fear not, do not be afraid. Because fear is the most common emotion that is addressed in the New Testament and addressed by Jesus himself. Yes, the angel addressed their felt needs of the moment, but he also addressed their forever needs. He addressed their emotions, but also their eternities. As Glenn quoted John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have, again, everlasting life, eternal life. Aren't we glad? Aren't we so glad that God would appear and announce the birth of his Son and we can know that, that if we know Jesus as our Savior, our sins are forgiven, we're bound for heaven, and the best is yet to Come, even Swedes and Norwegians can even say hallelujah to that. And, and you know, if that doesn't light our fire this morning, I think our wood is wet. You know, yeah, yeah, really. We need to be glad about that. God Himself incarnate, behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then the Lord uses three titles there. 
And I'll try to scoot through this really quickly. But the three titles he calls him, who is a savior. And of course, the savior is one who saves. A savior is one who rescues. Paul writes to Timothy, it is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It can't be many more straightforward than that. And then he says, whom I'm the foremost of all. So a savior saves he rescues, not just from temporal problems, we all have those, but from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin as we continue to seek his face day by day and ultimately from the presence of sin. And you know, even Jesus' mother Mary needed a Savior. She's already made reference to God as Savior. Uh, chapter 1, verse 46, And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Yes, she was special. There's no question Mary was special but she was also a sinner who needed a savior. Yeah, is he your savior today? Hmm? Is he your savior? Are you trusting in him alone to rescue you from the penalty of sin? Have you repented from your sin and received him consciously as your savior? He came unto his own people. His own didn't receive him, John 1.12 will say. But as many as received him, to those he, became, he gave the authority or the power to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Only Jesus can wash away our sin. Uh, have you come to him? Oh, I know that most of us have, but we never know who's here in an assembly. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Why were they weary and heavy laden? Because they were trying to, to keep all the laws of the Old Testament and all the extra laws and, and, and rituals of the, of the Pharisees and scribes, and they were heavy laden. And Jesus said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Remember? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. This is a spiritual thing, you see. He said, I will give you rest, and you will find rest when you take my yoke upon yourself. And then he said, for my yoke is easy, and my load is light. Do you see the Christian life that way, dear friend? That his yoke is easy, his, his load is light as we take his yoke upon ourselves. Yeah. There was been born for you a Savior who is Christ. Of course, that's a second title, Christ, Christos. Uh, the anointed one, Mashiach in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, M Messiah. The long-predicted Messiah had just been born in Bethlehem, and even a lowly Hebrew shepherd knew that Israel was looking for a promised Messiah, the final Passover lamb. So who is a Savior, who is Christ, and then the Lord, Kyrios here, the Lord, who is ruler, the master, he, he was a Savior, Christ the Lord. And certainly I believe we would agree today that, that the one who rescues us deserves to rule over us. Can we agree on that today? The one who rescues us certainly deserves to rule over us. Yeah. Do we allow him to rule us? Yeah. Is he Lord in fact as well as in name? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Yeah. And then verse 12 says, And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Uh, King James, swaddling clothes. When I was a kid back in Minnesota, I, I wondered what this swaddling. I never no one didn't know what a swaddling was a sign, but I didn't know what it was, what a swaddling clothes was. Well, probably the swaddling clothes had something to do with it, but it really wasn't the swaddling clothes. It was a sign. The sign was that a human baby would be lying in a manger, in a feeding trough. You know, you don't see that every day. And that was the sign. And the Messiah was to come through a royal lineage, but he wouldn't be found in a crib in a palace. No, he would be found instead in a stable or a cave, lying in a feeding trough where sheep and lambs eat. Yeah, that shouldn't surprise us again. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world would become the good shepherd who will lay down his life for the sheep like a Passover lamb. Again, it all fits together. So the greatest event in human history was prophetically anticipated. It was personally announced, and then it was practically applied in the lives, again, of real people. Verse 15 says, And it came about, came about that when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, 
that the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord made known to us. Let us go straight to Bethlehem then. <laughs> there was no ho-hum in their lives, was there? There was no bah humbug either. And it says they came in haste. No grass grew under their feet. And Bethlehem, of course, was teeming with people because of the census. And, of course, they didn't have a Rand McNally Atlas. They didn't have a GPS. They couldn't call Uber or Lyft. And <clears throat> maybe they had yellow, yellow camel, but they had no yellow cab, I'm sure. And you will find, it says in verse 12, you will find, implying a search there, and somehow these country bumpkins, yeah, these sun shepherds found their way to the intersection of swaddling street and manger avenue and there he was verse 16 they came in haste and found their way to where the messiah was born the people to deliver born a child and yet a king and so let's let's not gloss over this pause just for a moment to understand and appreciate the obedience of these humble shepherds these were just mere mortals like we are they were needy sinners like we are and yet the angels had hardly left when the shepherds were on their way to see this Savior who is Christ the Lord. And again, we need to take note that they changed their routine in response to God's revelation. Think about that. Would we have done that? Would we have changed our routine in response to God's revelation? Well, I'd ask you, do we do that? See, this is God's revelation. He's not speaking in angels, these through angels these days. We have his complete revelation here. And does reading his revelation change our routines? Does it change our thoughts? Does it change our hearts? God's revelation is given to us not just to inform us, but to transform us and conform us to the image of his Son. Yeah, we are to let God's revelation change our routines, change our thoughts, change our minds, change our desires, change our ambitions and our habits. We are to let God's revelation take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10 will say. Yes, you know, we can be doers of God's word just sitting in our chair reading God's word as we allow him to control and to shape our thinking according to his word. But sometimes doing God's word does require physical activity. So again, we take note of what the shepherds did after seeing Jesus, the Messiah. They made their way quickly to Bethlehem, verse 17. Then once they had been there, it says, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child who was Savior, Christ the Lord. And verse 18, it says, And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. And in that verse 20, then the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Now you go back through those last five verses, the words heard and told are repeated over and over and over. They heard and they told. They heard and they told. Does that describe us? We have heard. Do we tell anybody? Do we? These days? Hmm. This was the ripple effect of this good news of a great joy being repeated to the people around them. And again, today, that's our job. That's our assignment. That's our holy task. We are to tell what we've been told by God's revelation. We are to shape our routine in response to God's revelation. Again, you know it in Mark. It says, Jesus says, go into all the world. And as you're going into all the world, proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the good news. Proclaim what you have heard about the Savior. And again, thank you, Gideons, for, for giving out God's word around the world that you've done for years. Glenn Wass and Tim Smith and Steve King, thank you for what you do. And that's the reason I chose this passage, quite frankly. I knew there was to be a, a Gideon presentation. Linda and I have supported the Gideons for years and years. And, uh, and again, like the shepherds, you as Gideons as well are eager to get God's word out regarding the message of the Messiah. And Jesus said to those who follow him that they were to proclaim to every creature, all creation, the gospel. And this is a command, as you know. It's, it's not just a suggestion. But I wonder how many of God's people over the years, when they read and hear about that we're to proclaim the gospel to every creature, I wonder how many have just kind of shrugged and not audibly said, but shrugged and thought, nah, not really. Nah, no thanks. You know, 
I don't have the gift of evangelism. No, that's not my personality. Yeah, that's just not me to talk about Jesus to people. I'm just not going to do that. Of course, as we know, if that's our response, that's absolute disobedience. Yeah, yeah. Could this be any of us here even today? And if so, then the greatest story never old becomes the greatest story never told. How tragic. What a deathly silence that is. If we decide it's for somebody else to share the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, but not us. But our shepherds, our humble nobodies, went straight to Bethlehem. They came in haste. Then they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. He is a Savior, Christ the Lord. You know, evidently, the shepherds really believed what they believed. That's my conclusion. They really believe what they believe. And, and again, don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you do, and I'll tell you what you believe. To know and not to do is not to know at all. Do we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but through him, as Danny preached last week? Do we believe that Jesus said to proclaim to every, everyone the good news of forgiveness of sin only through him? And then I would ask, do we love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love? Do we love to tell the story? For some have never heard. I believe there are those in our Christian, so-called Christian America, who've never heard the gospel. They've never had it clarified. They think they know it. They've never had it really clarified to them. We love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. So, my friends, can I ask us today to commit today to the, to the ancient story, never old. Let's make sure it's not the ancient story never told. Would you bow for a moment, please? Gracious Father, we're so grateful for your patience with us, for your kindness and your grace toward us. You love us with an everlasting love, and you accept us. And we know that as we look, look to you and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we know that you provide for us all that we need for life and godliness and to be your ambassadors. Thank you for the great privilege of, of being your ambassadors and looking for Jesus to come here as well. Father, we think of of the lady who was blind from birth, who wrote 8,000 8, songs and hymns, and, and she admonishes us today to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, that Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Help us today, Lord, to love to tell that story for your glory, for our good as well, that we come in his matchless name. Amen. And amen.